Good evening, pastor, elders, brothers and sisters. It's our third day of elders week of prayer. God says, listen to the ones with gray hair on their head, even if they shave it off, <laughs> because they are full of wisdom. Our elders are doing a magnificent job so far. Let us bow our head in prayer, close our eyes as we show reverence to God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, O oh God, for this third day of elders' prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for keeping them and instilling them the words that you want us to say to speak to each other. We ask, O oh God, that you forgive us of all of our sins. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you be in our midst on today and let your peace reign on earth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you have done for us. Thank you most of all for sending your son, Jesus, to die to save us, that we could be with you. In Jesus' holy, glorious name, I pray. Amen. to everyone, to those online who are on the Sound My Voice, have a blessed evening. I'm delighted that you've tuned in to share with us on another series on the Elders Week of Prayer. We're talking about, are you ready for the Spirit? And of course, we're going to focus on the Holy Spirit tonight. My message tonight, although brief, is entitled, Manifestations of the Holy Spirit manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. God, we ask that in this brief preaching moment that you come below spirits, quiet our minds, O oh God, help us to focus on your word, help us to glean something from your word that may help us to grow and get closer to you, O oh God, that we can say like the psalmist, thy word of hidden my heart, that I might not sin against God. Help us have hearts that are fertile, Lord, break up the stoniness of our hearts. Help us have hearts that are fertile, where the seed of the word can germinate, take root, and grow. We ask you to bless us and increase our understanding. This we ask your son, Jesus. Amen. I'd like you to uh, join me in reading a brief portion of scripture. It comes from the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, chapter 3, 
and we'll read from verses 15 to 22. That's Luke chapter 3, verses 15 to 22. As the people were filled with expectation and all the questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but the one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winning fork is in his hand to clear the threshing floor, to gather the wheat into his garnery, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. But Herod, the milliner, who had been rebuked by him because of Herodias, his brother's wife, because of all the evil things that Herod had done, added to them, or by shutting up John in prison. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized, he was praying, the heaven opened up, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, be the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy word. And so before we get deeper into the ways that the Holy Spirit manifests itself throughout the Bible and also in our spiritual lives, um, we see that there's some symbols right in this passage for the Holy Spirit. One is a dove. The scripture tells us that the heavens opened up and a dove descended and landed on Jesus. And also the voice of God, his father, came and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And that sort of reminds me that we need to live a life where God can say, here is my son, here is my daughter, in whom I'm well pleased, just like he did for Jesus, because we're to be more and more like Jesus every day. But the role of the Holy Spirit is more active in our lives than sometimes we remember. But of course, we always remember Christ, because Christ died for us, and Christ is the mediator who bridges us back to God. And also we thank God the Father because Christ tells us often that the Father and I are one. And so we think of God the Son and God the Father. But often we don't uh, dwell a lot on God the Holy Spirit. And so those of us who have been understand that the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God. The, I don't want to say the third person is, but another person is for God. And so we see those symbols of dove and fire. And so the Holy Spirit shows up as fire. I'm thinking of another account where Christ told the disciples to wait in the upper room. That's in Acts chapter 2. And he says, wait. And at that time, the Holy Spirit will descend. He said, I'll send you the promise of my Father. And the promise was that if they would wait, if they would tarry or wait, the Holy Spirit will come and bless them and anoint them. And so they waited, they prayed, they waited. And of course, it says that a rushing wind came in the room and they saw something like cloven tongues of fire, which divided and rested upon all of them. And so they were able to speak in each other's language. Now, I know that a lot of people interpret that verse to mean they spoke in strange tongues, but that's not what the scripture says. It says that they were able to speak in each other's language, that when they all spoke, the Medes, the Perds, the Galileans, the Egyptians, all heard, the Greeks, all heard their own language. And so they recognized that something was operating here, that the Holy Spirit, which Christ had promised would come if they would wait and tarry, came and empowered them. And of course, in every event, you have your skeptics. And so the skeptic says, these men are drunk. And so Peter, the apostle God said, no, 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 these men are not drunk. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And what you hear them do and what you hear them express is the utterances that the Holy Spirit is enabling them to do. And so don't say they're drunk. Understand this is the Holy Spirit at work. 
No, there's a lesson in the Holy Spirit and Christ telling them to wait. The Holy Spirit could do that instantly, but why would the Holy Spirit tell them to wait? And so you see, waiting does a few things for us. Waiting builds patience. Waiting builds endurance. And these are two things that are needed if you're going to be on the kingdom march for God. And so the Holy Spirit recognized that they needed to wait on the Holy Spirit's own timing because we want things done and we want them done what? Now. But the Holy Spirit is trying to instill that the Holy Spirit works in its own timing. And so if you wait on the Holy Spirit, that would be what? The perfect time that to receive what the Holy Spirit has to offer. And that's why the scripture also tells us, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall what? Rise up with wings like eagles. They shall walk and not be weary. They shall run and not faint. And so waiting has a virtue. It's a virtue builder that you need to wait on God's timing because our timing and God's timing are not the same. And so as we wait, we build patience. As we wait, we build character. As we wait, we build endurance. And these are traits that the Holy Spirit desires to develop in us. And so the Holy Spirit had them wait until a point in time. Also, by waiting till the point in time, the right time, their power was maximized, that they were now emboldened and they were strengthened and they were able to be strong witnesses for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also a developer of men. When we look at Romans uh, 8 and 26, it tells us that the Holy Spirit or the Spirit intercedes for us in what? Moans and groans in, wor in wor sounds that what? Cannot be interpreted or understood with human words. And so that tells me that well, the Holy Spirit prays for us. John chapter 17 tells us that we have a God, Jesus Christ, who prayed for us. Christ prays a beautiful prayer in chapter 17. And likewise, Paul is alluding as in his letter to the Romans that the Spirit does the same thing. We don't think of the Holy Spirit as praying for us, but he, Holy, he tells the Holy Spirit does. It moans and groans in words that can't be understood on our behalf to what? God the Father and God the Son, so that his people, his children here on earth can be blessed and developed. Paul also tells us in 2 Corinthians and chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, therefore, what? Do not lose heart. Even though the outer man is perishing, his physical body is perishing, he says the inner man is being developed day by day. And so that tells us that the Holy Spirit works with us each day. It's a daily process that the Holy Spirit is, is working to strengthen us. The Holy Spirit is working to purify us. The Holy Spirit is working to make us into that which he can say, I'm well pleased, as he said for Jesus when Jesus was baptized by John. And, and so we have to remember that the Holy Spirit is working, and that tells me something, that as the Holy Spirit works, develop our inner man, and that's our spiritual being, day by day, we're being what? Heals spiritually. I need you to see that. Don't miss that, uh, my Christian brothers and sisters that as the Holy Spirit groans and moans and prays for us, and as it intercedes for us, and that as it renews us, because the Holy Spirit works in ways that sometimes we're not even cognizant that the Holy Spirit is working in ways that sometimes are not visible or not cognizant to our minds. But the Holy Spirit, just as Christ and God protects us with angels unseen and unaware, the Holy Spirit is working through us and in us when we give our lives to Christ. Now, there's a popular saying, and I've heard this by a lot of people, even people I work with, I'm, they would say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. And I'm here to tell you, anybody who says that to you does not know what they're talking about, because spirituality only comes from one source. It comes from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. If you haven't got your spirituality from there, then I'm here to tell you, you have spirituality that comes from the deceptor, the evil one, the devil, that archangel, Lucifer, who uh, becomes Satan. And so there's only one way to be spiritual, is through giving your life to Christ, it's through submitting to the authority of Christ, is uh, submitting to God's authority, 
and submitting to the Holy Spirit as well. And so the Holy Spirit is very evident throughout the Bible if we take time to read it, if we take time to research it, if we take time to look and learn to, be, to see that the Holy Spirit has always been on the move and involved in our lives. And so many Christians still don't understand the role of the Holy Spirit. But remember, the Holy Spirit is part of the triune God. Uh, as seven day, we understand that the three separate but co-equal entities to God. There's the entity of the Son, Jesus Christ. There's the entity of his Father. And there's the entity of the Holy Spirit. Now, often Christ would say, if you see me, you see the Father. If you hear me, you hear the Father. For the words that I tell you are not mine, but are given by my Father. And so everything the Father gives me, I give to you. The Holy Spirit is also a teacher. And so just turn to me one verse in John chapter 14. I'll read verse 26. So we get the essence of what the Apostle John is trying to uh, convey to us. And so verse 26 says, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I've said to you. And so when we are between a rock and a hard place, we don't know what to do. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to empower you and teach you. The Holy Spirit says it will teach you all that you know, need to know to live a victorious life. And so this is not an easy life to live. This is a life full of peril, full of disaster. We see crime, we see horrendous acts. As we see a lot of shootings today of man in humanity to man. And we wonder where God is in the midst of all of this. But even in the midst of a confusion, always remember that God still strives with his people. He never leaves us nor forsake us. He's with us to the end of the age. And I, I like to say beyond that, because God promises that for those who give their lives to him and submit to the authority of Christ, submit to the authority of God, and submit to the Holy Spirit, that they're preparing what? A place for us. And they promise in John, they'll come again and receive you unto themselves so that where they are there, you may be also. We know we like to think of that as death, but that's true in life too. God is preparing a place for God says when he comes again, he's coming what? With his reward. And so those who have submitted to the authority of the Holy Spirit will find that their garments are cleansed, their life is in order, that they're ready, uh, or what I call kingdom ready, to be with God. And that's the goal of every Christian man, every Christian woman, every Christian boy, every Christian girl, the whole Christian family has to be ready. And Christ makes us ready with the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit operates through God the Father and the Holy Spirit operates through God the Son. And, and so that's where their souls come from. And when God is on the move, when God is working, when God is cleansing, when God is healing, when God is teaching, it's the power of the Holy Spirit at work. And so we can't do any of this. That's why scripture says, well, without me, you can do absolutely nothing. I'm the vine and you're the branches. Unless you abide in me and I abide in you, you can do nothing. And so Christ says, just as I abide the Father, I need, and I'm one with the Father, I need you to be one with us. One with God, one with Christ, one with the Holy Spirit. And so as Christians, we have a responsibility to ensure that we present ourselves so that the Holy Spirit has access to us at all times, that we pour our heart to God. We have a quiet time where we go into our prayer closets at home or prayer room if you don't have a closet and pour out your heart to God so that God may anoint you through the Holy Spirit. I think we recognize the Holy Spirit moving our life when it comes to healing. The times when we're so sick that the doctor says, I can't do anything more for you. Go home and die. And that's when we understand the Holy Spirit. We begin to pray as we never prayed before, asking the Holy Spirit what? Heal us and anoint us and to take away this disease from us. I think of Paul 
uh, when he prayed to have the thorn in his flesh removed. He said, three times I prayed to God to move it. And God says, no, I will not remove it because in your weakness, my strength is sufficient for you. And so God is a healer. The Holy Spirit is a healer. We can't do anything without the power of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is not something to be afraid of. We tend to be afraid of spirits, but the Holy Spirit is a part of the triune God. And just as Christ is one with the Father and God is one with Christ, they're also one with the Holy Spirit. It's a part of the triune that cannot be separated because all three act as one. And so tonight we can be comforted with the fact that we have a God who prays for us. We have a Holy Spirit who prays for us. We have a Holy Spirit that seals us. The Holy Spirit gives us the mark or seal of God and marks us as children of God ready for the kingdom. And so we can't operate without the Holy Spirit. We can't operate without God. And we certainly can't operate without Jesus Christ because through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that we're saved. Paul tells the Romans that if we will confess our sins and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And with the heart, we open up to receive God's blessing and salvation. And so those two requirements must be done, as Paul tells the Romans, Romans chapter uh, 10, 9 and 10, this is the process by which you become saved. This is the process by which you become kingdom ready. This is the process that if you're going to make it into God's kingdom, you must submit to. The Bible also tells us that those who refuse to submit to the authority of Christ, those who refuse to submit to the, power, the authority of God, those who refuse to submit to the Holy Spirit will perish. Because you cannot find salvation in any other entity except this triune God. And so those of us who see the wisdom and see the light, submit ourselves, repent, ask for forgiveness. God sees our contrite heart, our contrite spirit, and forgives us because he already has made provision on a cross for us. He already has made provision that we can be residents of the new Jerusalem. And so when God comes in the second coming, those who are ready will be received. Those who have accepted Christ and have accepted God and accepted the Holy Spirit will be transformed. We will be rewarded with a thousand years, a millennium in heaven. And then we will be brought back to the new Jerusalem to ever be with the Lord. And the wonderful thing about our Christian legacy is that God says he is going to spend time, God the Father, God Son is going to spend time with us permanently on earth in the New Jerusalem. Isn't that a wonderful legacy tonight, my Christian brothers and sisters? And so our responsibility is to share this good news with those who have not yet accepted. Our responsibility is to share this good news with those who refuse to understand. Our responsibility is to share the gospel. We can't save our friends, but our responsibility is to share God's word that if you accept Jesus Christ, you'll be saved, that salvation will come to, your, to you that very instant because God has already made provision for us to be saved. And so the Holy Spirit is important. The Holy Spirit is an integral part of this Christian walk. The Holy Spirit is an integral part of this Christian witness in the world. And we're certainly called to be witnesses. We're called to be light. We're called to be sought. And the scripture reminds us that if we don't pray and if we don't stay the course and if we don't allow God to direct us and uses the powers that become sought that what loses is savor. 
And if the sword loses savor, the scripture says it's no good, it's only good to be thrown on his gravel, to be trod under the feet of men. And so we want to be careful. It also tells us that we ought to make sure that our speech is seasoned with salt so that we what we know how to speak to everyone and we know how to win over our friends to see the light and to see their need for a savior to see their need for repentance to see their need to yield to the holy spirit because it says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that jesus christ is lord and that's going to be done to even those who refuse to accept the Lord. And so we have no choice but to make ourselves available, to make ourselves agents of change, because that's what we are as Christians. We are now empowered to be light. Remember, the scripture says that God's word is what? A lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And so as lights, as agents of change, we are to be transformers of the world. And let me close by saying the Holy Spirit is so powerful that it's transformative. No one can receive the Holy Spirit and remain the same. When we accept Christ, we accept the Holy Spirit. And it says, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creation. All old things are passed away and behold, all things become new. And see, there's a newness that the Holy Spirit brings to us. There's a newness that Christ brings to us. There's a newness that God the Father brings to us when we receive him. And so it says that all things are passed away and behold, all things become new. And so when we accept Christ, we operate in the newness of the light of Christ. The old things we used to do, we do them no more. The old sin we used to love, we love them no more. In fact, the Holy Spirit drives up the desire for sin in our life. That's essential and very important. Because we can't become a Christian remain in our sins. No, I'm not saying we can become perfect. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying tonight, right? Christian brothers and sisters. We'll never be perfect till Christ perfects us. But once we accept Christ and we now have the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the power to avoid unnecessary sin and to avoid things that grieve the Holy Spirit and things that God is not able to look at us and say, here is my son in whom I'm well pleased as he did for Jesus. And, and so the, the Holy Spirit transforms us into the newness of Christ, the newness of Christian living, in the newness of change in the world. I want to remind you of something I read in the scripture. The portion of scripture says, if we learn to pray, and Elder Phil spoke last night on how to pray correctly, the power of prayer and the role of the Holy Spirit in prayer. But if we pray correctly, if we learn how to pray, it says that if we pray and to bind something on the earth, that God will do or reflect the same in heaven. We pray to bind wickedness on the earth and sin. God is going to bind wickedness and sin in heaven. And if we pray to lose God's goodness on the earth and God's word and God's comfort, God's chair and God's blessing, that God is going to do the same in heaven. That tells me that we are full partners with Christ, full partners with God, full partners with the Holy Spirit in ministry. And that's why Christ told Peter, he said, Peter, thou art Petrus, that's a Greek word for little rock or piece of rock and and he was saying to him you're a piece of the rock who i am because some people say the church is what built on peter <laughs> but don't misunderstand this passage the church is built on pete peter but the church is built on the rock of jesus and he was telling peter thou art a little piece of the rock a chip off of my rock and upon this church i shall build upon this rock I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so tonight, remember that the church of Jesus Christ, the church of God, the father, the church of the Holy Spirit, which we are, 
is built on the rock and solid foundation of Jesus Christ. And so the church is built on human faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. And the scripture tells us that not even the fiery darts of the devil or all the power of hell shall prevail against it. And so we thank God for the church. We thank God for the Sabbath. Because the Sabbath day was made for man, God sanctified it, hallowed it, made it holy. And this, that is a reminder to us that we ought to worship God, that we're called to be his uh, representatives. He, we are the uh, jewel of his creation and that Christ is perfecting us back as, as after we have sinned and strayed, bringing us back to God, bridging us back to God, becoming a mediator or poor predator for us. God seeks to get us on the part. Remember that God has a part for each Christian to walk. And if you don't know what your part is, please pray and ask God to reveal it to you. He will. If you don't have the wisdom to understand all of this and it's a mystery to you, pray and ask God to give you wisdom. Because one thing about the Holy Spirit will give wisdom to those who ask. And so... Oh, remember, wisdom doesn't come by age or intellect or education. Wisdom comes only from God. And so the Holy Spirit is set and ready to give you all the wisdom you need, as did for Solomon and David, his father, before him, and also teach you how to live this victorious life. The Holy Spirit seeks to ensure that you are a winner in the kingdom of God, that you walk right, you talk right, you work right, that you reach someone for the kingdom. That's why this past uh, year, our pastor had the theme of reaching out, bringing in. Each one, bring one. And so our responsibility is to, is, to, is to reach out to Christ. See, this Christian life is not for those who are selfish. If you live just for you and your family or yourself alone, then God can't use you. You have to make yourself available. Remember the Great Commission of Mark 16, 15 tells us, Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father, name of the Son, name of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them all that I've commanded you. That's why the Holy Spirit teaches us what we need to say. And so the scripture says, season your words with salt so that you offend no one. And so the Spirit makes us ready. The Spirit empowers us. The Spirit, the Spirit makes this Christian experience real. This Spirit makes this Christian experience functional and practical, and workable, and doable. And so in Christ, we can do it. In God the Father, we can do it. In the Holy Spirit, we can do it. And so don't get discouraged. It says, wait in the Lord, be a good cheer, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say in the Lord. Name the Father, name the Son, name the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God, I just thank you for this brief word that the Holy Spirit acts in our lives, not just in the Bible story, but in our present life, the Holy Spirit is moving and seeking to empower us. The Holy Spirit prays for us and moans and groans that we cannot understand. The Holy Spirit baptizes us with the fire of, the, of baptism. John gave us the water baptism, which represents the repentance. But Jesus and the Holy Spirit gives us a fire baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so baptize us through the Holy Spirit fire tonight, that we may be on fire for you. We may be ready and excited to be agents of change. We may be ready and excited to bring the word of God to a dying world that's growing darker and darker and more wicked by the day. And so, Lord, as we see these shootings of children, as we see shootings of people on the job, people in the hostels, people all over the places shooting with, with machine weaponry, like if they're just trying to practice for no reason. But as wickedness prevail, Lord, we as Christians pray that you release your power. Like the, the prophet Joel says that you poured out your spirit on those, the people in those days. We pray that you may pour out your spirit on these United States and all the countries of the world because we're becoming more wicked and more desperate. And so, Lord, we need an outpouring of your spirit as you open up the heavens and pronounce that Jesus was your son in whom you're well pleased. Listen to him. Open up the pores of heaven and pour the spirit in us today. We're getting more lost in the darkness. I pray for our churches, oh God, 
And I pray particularly for our church in at White Plains, the Southern Adventist Church, Lord, that we become a beacon of light for you. We become a beacon of hope. We become a, a church and a sanctuary where someone walks in, they hear a message that transforms them, that when they leave, they're not the same because scripture tells us no man can receive Jesus. No man can receive God. No man can receive the Holy Spirit and remain the same. And so bless us tonight. Anoint us with the Holy Spirit as we continue this week in our prayer and preaching, Lord. Just empower each speaker. Empower each elder. Thank you for being with me tonight to deliver this brief message. I pray that it touched the heart of someone and that it helps myself and all of us to dedicate ourselves, rededicate ourselves, to be committed to winning a soul for Christ. Bless us tonight, we pray. For Jesus Christ, we ask him. Amen. 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 Thank you, Elder Richardson, for that timely message. We really were blessed from hearing that message. And some of the takeaways is that uh, we know that God, uh, the Father, and also God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have our interest at heart, and they're working on us through the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ. Thank you again for those timely words. Now we're going to have another word of intercession prayer. We thank God that he has been so good to us, and we have so much to be thankful for, and we want to thank God for that, and we want to have a word of prayer to let him know. Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this Elders Week of Prayer. We're so grateful for the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. It is known that all over the country, we have extreme heat. But here, the Lord has blessed the weather. And here, the Lord has blessed us. And we thank you, Lord, that you have made us the salt of the earth. We thank you that you have made us a blessing, the light of the world. Because if there was no salt and if there was no light, what would this world be like? We thank you that we have a Christian influence, and we thank you for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for his uh, prayers and intercession for us before we know not what to pray for, Lord. We know that we want certain things, and we lift those things up to you, but we, the Holy Spirit knows what we need, and he, he is working out our best interest to make us kingdom ready. We thank you for the hedge that you have around about us. We thank you for the leadership of the church, and we thank you also for the members of the church. And we ask you, Lord, as we listen to these sermons on a daily or weekly basis, we ask you to help us not be just hearers of the word, but help us take the words that we hear and put them in our lives that we will be more like you. We thank you, Lord, for uh, blessing our children. We thank you for the hedge that you have around about us. And we thank you for the opportunity to be more like you. As we go in our day-to-day -day walk, empower us with the Holy Spirit. Help us be that which will draw, lift you up and bring those people to Christ that we uh, come in contact with. Help us not be uh, backbiters. Help us be encouragers and not discouragers. Help us have uh, be the blessing that you would have us be on this earth. We pray for our children, Lord. We know that they're struggling, and we ask you to empower them. Help them not be discouraged, but help them be encouraged. Help us be a person that uplifts and never tears down. We thank you for our wives, and we thank you for our husbands, and we thank you for our children. And we ask you, Lord, if there's sickness among us, help heal that sickness. Help us be uh, ready willing and able to serve you. Lord, we know that you have provided everything we need to be saved. You've given us books. You've given us scripture. You've given us the spirit of prophecy. You've given us righteous men and women that influence our lives. Help us put those righteousness men and women and the books and things to use that we may be saved. Lord, we know that you want us to be saved, but we have a part to be in that saving process. We ask you to in, help encourage us to study more, help encourage us to pray more, help encourage us to look on the life of Jesus and be more and more and more like Jesus. Lord, we would like you to say, this is our beloved 
sons, and this is our beloved daughters in whom you are well pleased. And we ask you to help us live up to that statement. We ask you to help us have a positive outlook on life. We know that sometimes darkness overshadows us, but we know that you're in charge. And we ask you to help us realize and recognize that you're in charge. And we help us realize that you have the outcome that we are looking for. And that outcome is to be saved. Lord, when it's all said and done, when the last elders uh, prayer, week of prayer has been issued, when the last prayer for the saints have been uttered, we ask you to save each and every one in that day in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We thank you, Elder Richards, and Elder Phillips, and also Pastor, for all these encouraging words and his intercession prayers. We thank God for you guys, for all the souls that you have saved over the years of bringing people closer to Christ. It's really a blessing for us as a family in White Plains to have good elders and pastors like you. We are so grateful for you pastor and elders. We could never thank you guys enough. I would like to say a short prayer closing out. Dear wonderful savior, we thank you for blessing us with another day. We thank you for blessing us with health and strength in our going and coming each and every day. We thank you for being such a tight-knit church family, dear God, for having great leaders like you and great elders and great pastors. We thank you for our finances that you have blessed us with our health, our strength, the love that you have extended to us each and every day, dear God, even when you're not worthy at time. But dear wonderful Savior, we ask you to keep your blessing upon us each and every day and help us to be better disciples to bring people closer to you and help us to be the, the people you want us to be, dear God, the Christians you want us to be, so you could be proud of us, dear God, Savior. And again, I thank you for the elders of the church and our good pastor. We're going to miss you at times, but you've been such a very good inspiration to us. We thank you, dear God, for everything that you've done for us in the past and all you have in store for us in the future. In your holy name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.